this the uh, excellent uh, academic performance. Uh, the one of the most important thing is that uh, it can enhance the, uh, the, our the university also department for the international visibility because he is very internationalized uh, uh, scholar. Yeah. So that's my personal feeling. And uh, probably that everyone here know of Pisa very well. So uh, even even though that, that is the fact, but I would like to give uh, also <laughs> a bit of time to give a brief introduction about Pisa, okay? And uh, Pisa, a graduate from the, our department during uh, 1972, after that he uh, completed his PhD from UTLA, and then he come back to uh, he told the, the C, uh, CC lab chair professor of cosmology, and uh, uh, he is the founding director of the lab center for cosmology and particle astronomy. Okay, before uh, he then, uh, came back to Taiwan, uh, he has initiated the founding of the Kennedy Institute of Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology at the Stanford University in two, uh, in the year of 2000. And um, he is a uh, APS fellow in 1994, uh, and uh, he obtained a two-time resident of the Gravity Research Funding Annual ASIC Nutrition Award. Uh, and, uh, uh, also, the currently has the two very uh, important project of uh, the in Taiwan. He has initiated the, the so-called uh, Ascari Radio Array Cosmology New Neutrino Observatory, and uh, also the other project is the Ultra Fast Flash Observatory. Uh, the last. Uh, the project just uh, uh, the uh, the firm just launched uh, successfully a couple of days ago, and uh, that's a big event in, in international, uh, also in Taiwan. And of course, the, during that event, the the, the Russian president Putin also attended them, right? Yeah. So, so you know the Pisan is very very international, and that today uh, Pisan will give us a talk. The title is Black Hole Information Loss uh, Paradox. The world continues to range. Please join me to welcome this. Thank you very much. And this is uh, a tremendous honor for being here to talk with you. And, uh, I know very well this, uh, the Cosmo also is one of the six institutions jointly organized this joint colloquium uh, and, uh, over the years. I know this is very prestigious, so I appreciate uh, Professor Chen's uh, invitation and uh, to share with you the uh, most recent development on this uh, black hole war that is sti that still continues. And uh, so it's uh, at the end of this talk, I hope you can carry away the, uh, the message that <clears throat> this is still not ending, and uh, <coughs> hopefully we are inches closer than before in terms of a final solution. Uh, so uh, let's let's uh, see what this is really about. Now, um, <coughs> my uh, longtime friend, or also uh, our department's uh, colleague, Professor Song Weixin, uh, likes to say that uh, in his years of experience organizing popular, popular science talks, uh, lectures. Two topics will always attract big audience. One is black hole, the other is dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> so I was trying to find a, 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 a image of dinosaur to put into my slides, uh, but later you will see whether I succeed or not. Um, <clears throat> now, since some of you may not be that familiar with, although you heard about or the term black hole every day. Uh, so if you allow me, I'll go through a little bit of its history, exactly what that means. Now, this is a diagram that you perhaps have seen very often. Uh, it, uh, well, it's
it's a picture of LIPO. And uh, the key message of this page is to say that general relativity actually predicts the existence of black holes. Now, at the end of my uh, popular science lecture on April 29th, which was, what, two weeks ago at the Dahuang Kuo CDA, I showed this also at my first page. And at the end of my talk, there was a lady raising her hand. She said, Xiao is the uh, is the black hole really in the trumpet shape? And what's the end of that trumpet? trumpet? So I then quickly recognized things we physicists take for granted is not so trivially uh, appreciated or shared with common people. What the original diagram uh, was mistaken was it puts x, y, z there. All right. So it, it implies that this is a 3D real object. But actually, the vertical axis we know very well as a physicist is uh, it's not a real space time. So I, I cross that out, replace it by curvature. So it is a, it's a function okay, of x, y. So this is, a, uh, this is what I like to say. This is to show you that the space-time curvature will eventually become larger and larger and larger and towards infinity. And that's the black hole singularity. At some point, um, perhaps around somewhere, where inside which lights cannot even come out, and we call that the event horizon. Now, the first black hole solution was uh, found <clears throat> a few months after Einstein finished, uh, after 10 years of effort, his famous general relativity in November 1915. So, if I remember right, even by no December or as late as January, Einstein received a mail from the Eastern Front of Prussia, Russian War, and where Schwarzschild served as a lieutenant. And this person is amazing. I always thought that he was just an you know, ordinary somebody, but I didn't realize he actually got his PhD from Göttingen and he was so good already as a child protege that uh, he was already recognized. And he became a professor there at very early age. By the time when Berlin, Germany, and at the time Russia, built the, the first and world's largest observatory in Berlin, he was invited over to Berlin as the first director when he was only 36. Imagine that. And he was quickly elected to the uh, Prussia Academy of Sciences, I think, within a year. By the year 40, he was, uh, the World War I broke out, and he volunteered himself. As a director, he said, well, I took off my suit, put on the uniform to serve in the army. And uh, you can imagine his mathematics is very good. Einstein's general relativity, uh, Einstein's equation is very uh, nonlinear, hard to solve, but he managed to have that. And even more amazingly, uh, so Einstein checked and agreed with his results recommend the publication to the, to the, to the proceedings of uh, Prussian Academy. So this was the famous, um, oh, I didn't know this thing even, this is a movie. But anyway, the, uh, the, uh, the key for this is, uh, of this page, is that this is like, you know, Pythagorean theorem. <coughs> so your total distance squared equals to your component uh, distance squared sum. Some moment. So this is just that. But space time is together, right? Einstein taught us already in 1905. So you have time and space as four dimensions. But in each one in front, as slightly different from, from Euclidean geometry, <coughs> there's a coefficient in front. Now, which, uh, uh, which is radius dependent if you have, this is a spherical symmetric. So you go from the origin. So there's this. But quickly you see that, okay, by the way, this is the inverse of that. But quickly you see that when r hits some value, such as here, 2gm over c squared, then this term is equal to that term. Now, your, the coefficient of your dt squared disappears. It's zero. No matter how you change dt squared, it doesn't matter. Now, worse yet here, it's one over. But one over zero is an infinity. Now, so 
you can't even move a little bit because then it, you have infinite chain. So there is this very special location which is now which is now called event horizon with this radius. Okay, and at that point, this this whole thing is not continuous. You know, actually, if you pass a little bit, plus an epsilon or minus an epsilon, the solution is fine. Okay, but at that point, they're not continuous. And I, I mentioned this because I want to use that fact to explain something else later. <coughs> well, this is of course artistic uh, rendition of uh, of uh, terrestrial black hole. But th they what they try to show you is that the space time so curved towards the horizon, where this is the Earth. You see, it's now already banana shape with South America here and North America there. All right. Now, uh, okay, this is a short show. Short show, by the way, for those who uh, enjoy Chinese here. Schwartz means black, right, in German. And Schill, it's like English Schill. So it's a you know, black ship. And this is a black ship. So I think he uh, already, his parents knew <laughs> that he would discover this. Uh, we call this structural radius, shuashi, fanji. Okay, now, uh, then, see, from 1916 all the time until 1963, there was no more solution to black hole. You see how hard it is. But on the other hand, of course, most smart physicists decided to work on quantum mechanics during that time. So, well, anyways, by 1963, Roy Kerr from New Zealand, uh, but he found this when he was in the US. Uh, okay, for those who are still alive, I do not put down their, their, their date. No, I'm sure. <laughs> so he's still alive, and I actually, I know him. Um, now, so he found a spinning black hole solution. So now, black hole, well, if it's heavenly body, bodies, uh, it typically spins, like our sun, you know, all stars. So. It is more physical to find a black hole solution which allows the spinning. Again, this is a Pythagorean theorem, but now somewhat more sophisticated. But I, I have no interest in uh, putting, you know, telling you the details. As long as you have seen this movie, <laughs> Interstellar. Okay. This actually I took from this is a movie poster. Okay. The resolution not too good. There is a some tiny thing here. Another black hole. But this is the solution. This is the Kerr solution. And uh, of course, you know that Kip Thorne uh, was the advisor to the interstellar movie. And so everything about black hole is guaranteed to be correct. <laughs> he and his students even found some new facts and published paper uh, by, uh, in, you know, by helping this movie. OK, now, um, talking about black holes, I feel obliged to tell you that there are several different types of black holes, at least three. Experts may tell me that, well, no, there's number four or five, but I, for our purpose today, there are three. First is supermassive black hole, millions of, to billions of so, solar mass. For example, like the one uh, Ma Zhongfei Jiaoshou, Professor Ma, Zhongfei Ma of UC Berkeley found uh, several weeks ago, maybe a month ago, which was billions of solar mass totally huge. Usually, they can come along with jets. But our own Milky Way uh, central black hole is only millions of, so of, solar, uh, of, millions of solar mass. Now, uh, that one's dormant. That's why our ancestors, whether Egyptians or Greek or Chinese, we, our, 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 our fairy tales never had something with, with jets. Uh, only Milky Way. Uh, so, it was only discovered in 1998. So, this late, before we didn't even know. Now, <coughs> then there's the stellar size black hole. This I don't mean exactly solar mass size, because if a, 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 an astrophysical object is only solar mass size, then after it burns out of its uh, nuclear fuel, its collapse will not form black hole. It's too light, so we can only form neutron stars. But it has to be at least three. Now, lately we have another news that uh, LIGO has discovered for the first time the uh, gravitational waves. Now, and as a, as a, how should I say, it? 
as a bonus of their discovery. And if you read through their abstract, abstract, they were able to say that this K, as a result of the coalescence of two black holes, binary black holes, one 29 solar mass, the other 36. Such accuracy, these things exist. And the reason that they could say that was because they use fancy computers to numerically calculate general you know, Einstein equations. As I say, it's nonlinear, very hard to calculate it nowadays. You can do it once in a while, but it's always in a simple, simple situation. In this very complicated situation, this, this, you know, the spin down and all that kind of thing, you have to rely on computers. And then you match with the observed gra gravitational wave signals, then you refer back. You say, well, it, it was a result of 29. Of course, they try and error a lot. But so, these things exact, exist. If you're ever interested, I, I, know, I know you do, uh, one website has this uh, picture actually in, mo in motion. It's like a cartoon and very interesting to watch. The entire space time was dragged and you know, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, something, uh, well, it's like a big thing. So now, <coughs> the third type, <coughs> We call it primordial black holes. <coughs> this, the, this type of black holes were born at the beginning of the universe when it was still extremely high temperature, high density, and so that the space time at that time was so quantum mechanical, let's say, they, they bubbles, they, they, they're unrest like water at 100 degrees in a pot. Now, once in a while, it jumps out and it can become a black hole. Now, these are not a result of a <coughs> stellar sized object. It's not a burning of uh, nuclear fuel and then at the end of a gravitational collapse. This was not, okay. So these are typically small, like Planck size. These by now, uh, well, there's a long story about that, but uh, we will uh, perhaps come back to it. Now, so after these two wonderful black hole solutions uh, I just mentioned to you by Schwarzschild and Kerr, then there came a wonderful golden time, uh, well, which starts from uh, Kerr's uh, solution. I would say uh, um, from the early 1960s to mid 1970s. <coughs> in particular, in this year, two years, 72 and 73, there was a uh, wonderful, remarkable development uh, by the name Black Hole Thermodynamics. These are by uh, <coughs> a few uh, famous uh, uh, physicists, including Hawking, uh, James Bardeen. This is the famous uh, John Bar Bardeen's son. Uh, but he's himself famous, by the way although he didn't get a Nobel Prize. He's a very famous cosmologist, as well as several others. <clears throat> now, so uh, what was found was that this black hole stuff, this black hole can even have some properties like the thermodynamics, right? So, uh, <clears throat> but here I found a rather interesting quote from Arnold Solopay. He said, thermodynamics is a funny subject. The first time you, uh, you, you go through it, you uh, you don't understand a thing. Then the second time when you go through it, you think you understand it, except a few, one or two small points. Now by the third time when you go through it again, you know you don't, you still don't understand it. But by then, you are already so used to it, so it doesn't matter, uh, doesn't bother you anymore. I think this is perhaps true for most of us, not just thermodynamics, quantum mechanics, whatever. It's the sabuchi, it's uh, always true. Okay, so when you say something like with confidence, like what I'm pretending right now, please don't trust me. No, I'm actually don't know a thing. So this is just because I keep talking about it, and after a long stage. while, huh? Well, it's that stage right now. That's right. That's right. Now, uh, <clears throat> so what are the what is the black hole thermodynamics? Uh, so there there are also laws. Okay. And if you, aha, uh -huh, you graduate students, you know, you have learned this <coughs> when you're sophomore. 
So Zeal's law, uh, law, oh, sorry, Zeal's law, uh, it says that the surface gravity of of a non-rotation rotating black hole is constant. So it says that if you have a terrestrial black hole, it's not rotating, then the gravity on the surface everywhere is the same. It's almost like saying nothing, but that's why it's called zero. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, first law. If you recall what first law of thermodynamics was, but first law of black hole thermodynamics says that the change of total energy equals to that of the, the change of the area, the angular momentum, and the charge. Area, angular momentum, and the charge. These are the three only attributes of a classical black hole. Okay, and uh, so this is, uh, uh, yeah, it spins, then uh, it, uh, it has a surface area, of course, and then you can put some charges on it. So this is all you can do. Now, <coughs> so, um, Mathematically, your dE is equal to kappa over a pi times dA, Q times dJ, uh, omega times dJ, omega is the angular momentum, plus pi times dQ, this is the charge. Now, uh, uh, well, anyway, so this is that. But second law, second law says that the change of area over time must be larger or equal to zero. Uh, so we'll come back to this one. The third law, zero surface gravity of uh, black hole does not exist. In another word, kappa here cannot be zero. Okay, so this is a fourth law, third law. Now, <coughs> now if quick eyes, right, it doesn't take big seconds time. Anybody say, okay, if there's this such a black hole thermodynamic, and I put my thermodynamics textbook, I open it, Compare line by line, I say, okay, wow, you tell me that second law is that dA over dt must be larger or equal to zero. But on the other side, I have dS over dt larger or equal to zero. So there must be some connection between the black hole surface area and the entropy. Ah, so here's Bekenstein, and here is the famous Bekenstein, but Hawking uh, actually has already contributed because he was one of the like of thermodynamics originator. So the the entropy of well you can you can say, you can consider this as a black hole or Bekenstein talking uh, happens to be also always uh, both are dh. So entropy equals to kb times area surface area divided by four l sub p squared. Now uh, what's kb? Kb is uh, Boltzmann's constant. And it tells you that when you time multiply by the system's temperature, it's the total energy. All right. Now, uh, well, I cannot emphasize more how seminal, how original, how historically important Boltzmann is. And if you have happen to have read his biography, and you feel very sad about his strategy, uh, because at the time, not almost you know all the establishment in physics did not believe in. Now, Bekenstein uh, is luckier. He was well recognized already some decades ago. Um, unfortunately, he passed away last year. He's not very old, but uh, his, his health is not that good. Now, uh, LP here means Planck length. Planck length is 10 to the minus 35 meters. That is uh, named after Planck because when, after he discovered his H bar, he uh, one day he had nothing else to do, so he started playing with constants. And uh, with Newton's <coughs> constant, his, con his own constant, I don't know how he called him his own constant, but let's call it Planck's constant, and uh, speed of light. That was 1900, and five years before Einstein discovered general relativity. So, but uh, I think he, he has already believed that C is a constant. Now, putting these together, sometimes with three powers, sometimes two powers, divide, multiply, and he could come up with quantities with the dimension of space, of time, of energy, <laughs> mass, and so on. Okay, and that's called Planck scale. And the length is here. Okay. Now, uh, so therefore, entropy has, should, have, should be dimensionless, isn't it? Uh, or with, with KB. But anyway, so it's this. Um, <coughs> Now, the 
you have been in Vienna before, and this is his tomb, it's customary in Europe where people who have made historical contribution at the, uh, their tombstone, just with uh, their obituary. And what's better than having your own equation <laughs> in your obituary? This is just wonder. Uh, notice that K does not have a sub B. You never call yourself, give yourself some name. No, but uh, this, is, this is wonderfully striking and simple. Now, what is entropy? We, this we all know from, from this one. So it's, the, it's a measure of disorder. If you have a piece of ice flake, which goes like this, pretty orderly, but uh, you know the change is towards sorry, towards you know like water or random. So you say, well, no way. I do eat ice bars. It does change from water to ice. So what are you talking? But you know that's because you have a refrigerator, and you know that behind the refrigerator there is a big compressor. Actually, it could it. It requires more energy to prepare that. But this is, that is not a natural tendency. But anyway, so this is entropy. And uh, so this is again about second law of thermodynamics. You see a, an egg broken on the, on the table. And you say, well, uh, this I, I can understand. And I imagine that before this, this mo moment, there was an egg in whole shape. And then became like this. Right? You never imagine that this this thing will all turn back into an egg with shell unbroken. Why? Because this is more disordered. Now, uh, <clears throat> so the phase space is bigger. Let's say it this way. Now, uh, <clears throat> so coming back to this Bekenstein Hawking or black hole entropy business, this equation is truly amazing. Uh, I think every quick eye uh, in this room can already recognize. Thermodyn entropy and Boltzmann constant have, have to do with thermodynamics, right? And this A area of a black hole certainly is the result of general relativity, and it's certainly relativity tells us matter and is equivalent to, to geometry. Now then, in this Planck constant, uh, Planck, uh, Planck link, we know it has Newton's constant involved, and we know also there's the H bar involved. So all these are linked together. But I think worse yet, this entropy is not proportional, like what typical standard thermodynamics is uh, teaching us, proportional to the volume of the system. Instead, it's proportional to the area. You, you know, there's this volume being encompassed, but how come the entropy only is proportional to the surface area. So this is very strange. Already, you know, this is kind of, you already smell something strange. Now, <clears throat> this ever smart Hawking uh, did not stop there. He actually was the one who, he probably hate himself very much that he did not himself propose that first. Of course, he now it's called Bekenstein Hawking entropy. He did not say it just right out loud when he developed his third, second law of thermodynamics, that this should be proportional to entropy. Well, anyway, the credit goes to Hef Beckenstein, and, uh, uh, who first said it. Now, with this uh, ever smart talking, then he quickly thought, if there is something called entropy for this black hole, there must be some temperature associated with it. This is what thermodynamics usually do. ETS or SDT, you know very well. Now, so what is that temperature? Now, you can, you know, Bekenstein could say, well, I'll, I just found this, in, you know, interesting coincidence. If they seem to be, uh, but Hawking went one more step to show you that, to show people that this is actually a physical thing. There is indeed a temperature for the body. And that was that 